Okay. Fine. Hello, praise the Lord, and good evening to every one of you. Good evening. Good, good evening. It is my greatest honor once again to introduce to us a topic that has become uh, a joy to multitudes, and at the same time also for many, um, a challenge because of their skepticism. I'm talking about the coronavirus uh, vaccine. Uh, as of today, our country has vaccinated over 10 million people and the number still continues. So many theories has been raised about the source and um, the essence of this virus. Some even going to the extent of saying it is not real. And too many people also have challenges with the vaccine. Some going as far as saying that uh, the vaccine is a mark of the Antichrist. But today, helping us unravel the mysteries around the virus and the vaccine is one of our own, uh, Dr. Diane Adair, a consultant in public health medicine and a public health advisor to the NHS. This is a follow-up of an information she shared with us some time ago because multitudes, multitudes missed out. So today the basic topic is understanding the vaccine and it is my greatest honor to introduce to us Dr. Diane Ade. Over to you, Doc. Thank you very much, Pastor. So today we said we were going to talk about providing you with information to make an informed decision when you get the opportunity to take the vaccine. I would like to start by saying, as, as Pastor said, I'm a public health doctor. I have worked in Ghana, as a public health doctor and was part of the team that delivered the polio eradication, implemented the polio eradication program in Ghana. I've also in my time as a public health doctor worked as the medical director for the implementation of Severix, the vaccine against cervical cancer. And I've also worked in various guises in this pandemic. The other issue that people may want to know is whether I have taken the vaccine. And the answer to that is yes. So I don't want you listening to this and worrying about that. I have taken the vaccine. My husband is also a frontline doctor and he's also taking the vaccine. So we'll talk about giving you the information that we considered when we were making the decision as to whether to take the vaccine or not. I thought it's quite important for you to know that when you are making the choice, all of us, we make choices and we always weigh the consequences of one decision over the other. It has risks, it has benefits. So we considered what we know about the coronavirus infection and the disease it causes, COVID-19. And then we also considered what we know about the concerns and myths about the infection that people have talked about, that we've heard on the news, that we may have received on our WhatsApp. And then on the other hand, you weigh the um, vaccine that is being proposed. You want to think about what are the benefits versus what are the concerns that I have about the vaccine. And in the end, depending on which one you feel weighs heavier, if you think the risk of the virus and the infection is bigger than any reported risk from the vaccine, then you may make a decision to take it. So I thought it's important we consider it in that way. So we will talk about infections. And I think it's quite important we set the context of our discussion in the, on the basis, on the premise that 
we deal with infections every day. We deal with infections every day. Vaccines are nothing new. We grew up in Ghana. We grew up in the Caribbean. We are used to vaccinations. Here in the UK, in the US, vaccines are nothing new. We know the coronavirus is a problem and it also has a specific challenge for the black community, which I thought we need to hammer on. And also for the fact that vaccines, as I said, we know the COVID vaccine is safe and it's effective. And I, th- I will also address some of the issues which are quite important in us making the decision. So these are common infections we all know about. We know about measles, we know about malaria, we know about TB, chicken pox, the various hepatitis. They're nothing new, okay? We come in contact with them all the time and our bodies have ways of dealing with these infections. So what happens when you come in contact with an infection is that your body is going to mount a response. So on this side, I've said you are exposed to the infection. Not everybody who comes in contact with measles will get measles. Mm. So you come, you get exposed to it. Some people get the infection. Some people will go on to develop the disease. So you see that they get the body rash of measles or of chicken pox or the common cold. People start sneezing. And then after you've had the disease, what has been caused by the virus? There are potential complications. Why do we get complications? Because the disease goes on to destroy certain things. And that's what results in the complication. So Mm. that you may end up getting pneumonia. I've put an immune response on the side because in addition to your body fighting the infection, as you've come in contact with it, your body also mounts an immune response. What do we mean by an immune response? It means that the body is saying, this shouldn't be here and I want to get rid of it. So the body tries to fight it. And as it fights it, it develops certain proteins, which we call antibodies. And these proteins may help your body to remember, not just to fight, to the current infection they've been exposed to. But also it helps your body to remember. So when your body comes in contact with that infection again, as in the case of measles, it remembers, oh, when I was a little boy or when I was a little girl or a year ago, I saw this virus. And this is what this is the protein this is now various ways in which you immunity you can get it actively by getting the infection and fighting and that's what we call natural that's what we call a natural infection and you develop the antibodies to it or we can almost artificially help your body to react Mm -hmm. as if it's come in contact with the infection. Mm -hmm. And then it does the antibodies and it's the same thing. So that's when we patients in which you don't really come in contact with the infection, but you get the antibodies straight away. So you would notice that because mothers give immunity, antibodies to their children through breast milk, they don't get measles as soon as they are born. There are certain infections that they are protected from. And one of it is measles, for example. So you give your child breast milk, you pass on these antibodies. 
or you can somebody is very sick in hospital and we want to protect them immediately that is called a passive immunity your body has not reacted to it but we are giving in this case we are considering active immunity and how we do it in an artificial way So I said vaccine, three ways in which we make them. You either take the whole um, virus and then you almost, you kill it off so that it cannot cause disease. Mm -hmm. And then you add certain chemicals to it mm -hmm. and then chemicals and um, certain substances to it to make it easy for it to go into the body. Or you can take part of the virus, part of whatever it is you want to do. And why does this work? Because we know that the virus, every virus, every organism, whether it's a virus or bacteria, it has to get into your body. And so you may want to take part of it that tells your body how to react to it and you just develop that bit of it and I think the way I described it the last time was that you can have a car and you can have a red car a red Mercedes Benz you take the engine out of the Mercedes Benz that's what makes it a Mercedes Benz but everybody looking at the body still sees it as a Mercedes Benz but you've taken the engine out. So it's no longer a Mercedes Benz. It's just the shell of a Mercedes Benz. And you drive around with it. And everybody says it's a Mercedes Benz. And they react to you like a Mercedes Benz. Okay. That's how when you take a portion of the virus, it behaves. You've taken the naughty bit out, the nasty bit out, but you've got a shell. And that's what the AstraZeneca COVID vaccine did. So they took the real thing out. And then you've got the new version where we call them the mRNA virus um, vaccines. What are mRNA vaccines? mRNA, it's the messenger RNA. It just tells the body it's a messenger. So under normal circumstances, your body makes thousands and thousands of proteins. Your body, the cell itself makes thousands and thousands of proteins. There are loads of messengers. You're sending them that go and tell my cell to make this protein. So as the previous two um, ways I've described, basically when they present to your cell, they go into the, as an aspect of your cell that we call the nucleus. And then they tell your nucleus that, tell our cell, send a message to the cell to make some of us, make a messenger RNA to make some of us. The new vaccines are saying, we're not going to tell the cell, but we're going to bypass that because we're in a hurry. So it's mm -hmm. taking a specific part of the virus and it's made it into an R M M a messenger RNA, which goes into your body and tells your body the same thing, make some proteins, make some antibodies to the virus so that when you come in contact with the virus, you will remember it and fight it. So that's basically what I've explained, that vaccines work by imitating the virus. It tells your body to recognize and then fight the virus when it comes in contact with it in real life. That's all that vaccines do. And these are some common vaccines that we've worked with over the years, and they've saved billions and billions and billions of life for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. So we no longer have smallpox because in the 1980s, it was eradicated. We've tried to eradicate polio. We give our children various vaccines, the MMR, the DPT. We if you come from an African country, a Caribbean country, because there are high rates of TB, we give the BCG vaccine because, again, it protects against tuberculosis. 
we give the cervical cancer vaccine. The, it's called the HPV vaccine because we found out that cervical cancer is caused by a vaccine. So we're used to vaccines. Vaccines are nothing new. The next bit that we've come to now is when we are considering the situation we are in. I thought it's important we do a recap on what we know about the coronavirus because a lot of us don't realize that not everyone who gets the disease, it's known. And so I've called it a disease pyramid. Some people will get exposed to the virus. They've gone to the shop, they are talking to friends. They don't get infected. We don't know why. And then some people may get infected. They went to a party. They went somewhere that someone had the virus. And so they've been pinged by the NHS app or a friend of theirs has told them, I tested, <clears throat> excuse me, positive, but they don't have any symptoms. And they are thinking, really? But they are positive. Okay, they've got the virus. Then you have some who also have mild disease. Oh, I lost my sense of taste yesterday. I couldn't smell yesterday. I've got a bit of sniffles. I'm just feeling a bit tired. They've got mild disease. They are at home. Some will have moderate disease. They have difficulty breathing. They may stay at home. Others would end up in hospital. The important thing that I want you to note in this is the various numbers that we hear all the time is this bit. It's just the top bit. It's the tip of the iceberg. The majority of people who have had the come in contact with it and either not been infected or have it with no symptoms, we don't really know about. Okay? So park that. I thought just to give you an idea of where we are to date. In Ghana, today, we have 5,515 cases. There have been 424 deaths. And they've confirmed just under 70,000 positive cases. Remember the pyramid that I said. So even though we've had these confirmed cases, remember the large bit of the pyramid of people who have the virus and yet don't know because they are not showing any symptoms. In the UK, it's a similar picture. We have a lot, we've had over 3 million, almost 4 million confirmed cases. Today, we reported almost 17,000 new cases. We've yeah. had a lot of deaths, 106, over 106,000 tragic lives have been lost. And we've got about 27,000 cases in hospitals. Again, I'm emphasizing that remember we are talking about a pyramid of disease. There are a lot we do not know about. This is just the tip of the iceberg. For us to get a sense of how significant this disease is, I thought it's important to find out who gets admitted to hospital. And early on in the pandemic, we heard there were underlying medical conditions. There were underlying medical conditions. What mm. are some of the underlying medical conditions people talked about? Mm. So we know that people who were asthmatic were likely to be admitted to hospital. Hypertensives, people who are obese. And when we say obese, we don't mean obese and they are falling off the chair. People mm. whose body mass index is over 30, you wouldn't even think they were very fat if you looked at them, okay? Diabetes, as I've said, and if you have several conditions, it causes a problem. The other thing that we've also noted is that, so I, I had a look at the data, sorry. I had a look at the data and said, what happens with black people? And you would see from this graph that when you looked at those with underlying conditions, the black population, if you had 
400 people, a lot of the blacks, the dark blue represents the proportion of underlying conditions in black people. I'm focusing on black and minority ethnic groups, well, really black people, because I am trying to address black Africans, you know, uh, all of us in Africa, all of us black people in the UK, us in the Caribbeans and our relatives, because it's relevant to us. I'm really addressing this from that perspective, not to say it doesn't matter to the white or Asian population, but I'm really focusing on blacks, okay? So if you look at the proportion of people who are black with hypertension in hospital, it's more than half. And the same for other diseases. The other thing I looked at was what are the occupations with the highest death rates in COVID? And they call them high proportion of contact. You would see it's main, mainly low skilled occupations. You would see um, caring populations. And a lot of us in the Black communities, we do these jobs. We are carers. We are um, working in leisure. We are working in canteens. We are serving people. We are doing a lot of patient contact. We are cleaning somewhere. So we come in contact with people with a lot of people we are bus drivers so we come in contact with a lot of people so this is the same whether you are a nurse in a hospital a doctor in a hospital you know um you work in a supermarket that important thing there is not so much the profession or what you are doing but the fact that you come in contact with a lot of people and then look at what's happening, what's, what that has meant to the black population. We have a higher share of positive tests. So if you look here, even though we are fewer, for example, within the British population, if you compare the number of positive tests that we are getting to the number of people in the population. That is what we mean by rate. You see that mm. for blacks, it's about 600 per 100,000. If you take 100,000 people, 600 are testing positive compared to 200 for whites and compared to under 400 for the Asian population. For blacks, it's over mm. 600, okay? So we have high positivity rates. Again, if you look at those, remember I talked about the tip of the pyramid, those who get very unwell and so end up in hospital. Again, you have high rates in Blacks. So in the US, they form 18% of the population, but 33% of those who were admitted into hospital. So as I said, it is a problem. Here, we are looking at those who end up critically unwell in critical care. You would see that overall in the UK, Blacks form 3.3% of the population. And yet we form almost 14% of those admitted into critical care when they get COVID. And then here, we're looking at who dies when they get the infection, when they are unwell. Again, here, the dot is where you um, expect to be with the population, okay? And then the graph shows where we are. So if you look at the white British, we've standardized with them. This is it, the Bangladeshi form about 0.4% of the population. This is where they are, but this is where they are in debt. This is how high. So a lot more people die. This is it for the Black African. Look at it for the Black Caribbean. And this graph is from the UK. 
So the Black Caribbeans form just under six, 0 0.6, less, less than 1% of the population. And yet look at the numbers that are dying. Almost 80 per 100,000 compared to less than 30 per 100,000 for the whites. So you can see that for those of us of African descent or Caribbean descent, for black people in general, it's impacting, the pandemic is really impacting us in positivity, in hospitalization, in severe hospitalizations and in deaths. So what you can say therefore is that Actually, we've been going through this pandemic, hand, face, and space, since March 2020. We know from what the ONS said that up to about 80 to 90% of the population are still at risk of infection. And that was quite concerning because of all the 100,000 people who have died, the many hospitalizations, we are still saying that up to 80%, 80, 90% of the UK population and Ghana and the Caribbean are still at risk of the infection. So I thought actually it's likely to be a when you will, you know, it, it's circulating you will come in contact with the virus, not an if. And I'll add here that when I looked at the Spanish flu, the, the, the Spanish pandemic everybody has talked about in 1918, 1919, there were four waves. The second, third wave were more deadlier, and that was when it affected Africa and developing countries and there were loads of deaths, which is what we are seeing now. So you can see that in the second wave, we're getting a lot more cases in Africa and the Caribbean, and we're getting a lot more deaths. So it's likely to be a when. You're likely to come in contact with the virus. And if not you, a family member, okay, could get the virus. You could say, I'm young. But a family, you could get it and give it to a family member. And the risk of severity we've learned is increased because it could be because of age, underlying conditions, obese, you know, and you do a high contact job. So I want you to park it that it is a problem. Okay, so the COVID is a problem. Then we're going to talk about the vaccine and we are looking specifically at the COVID vaccines. We want to know, are they safe? Are they effective? There are three, I think there are now five vaccines that are licensed in the UK. And just so you know, there are about 200 candidate vaccines. About 60 are in trials at the moment, but 200 different companies are working to get vaccines to vaccinate the whole world of, is it 7 billion people? We've already talked about how vaccines work. They basically come, con your body into thinking that they've come in contact with a real thing. So it makes proteins. Then when it comes in contact with a real thing one day, one day, then it can fight against it. So we know that we've talked about it. What do we know about the specific COVID vaccines? They've been through a very rigorous process of trials to determine whether they work or not. And I've set it out here in a very simplistic way. So first of all, I've said there are 200 candidates um, vaccines that are currently people are working on. And some of them are in the lab saying, will this work? If I do it in this way, will it work? Is it safe? And at what dose is it safe? So they've gone through this before they come to test in human beings. And when they come to test in human beings, that's what we call phase three trials. They give it to an individual. So some people will get the vaccine. 
some people will get what we call a placebo because we want to check that. Is it by chance? We want to eliminate chance. So they do what we call a blinded trial. And that is the only way you can tell whether the effect you are getting, the safety you are getting, the reduced severity you are getting, is it really due to the vaccine? That's what you are asking. And they defined upfront, we want to see whether it reduces the risk of disease. And is, does it reduce the risk of severe disease? Remember our pyramid again. What the trials showed was that all the three vaccines, that's the AstraZeneca, the Pfizer, the Moderna vaccine, and now the other two that have been licensed, were very safe and very effective in reducing this. So the pool of people here that every day Downing Street comes to stand there and say so many people are in hospital, so many people are in critical care and they are on machines, machine is breathing for them, they are in a coma, that's here in critical care uh, or have died. It's 90% effective in reducing that risk. Mm -hmm. So think about it. This bit, it doesn't really matter because they are not really unwell. But it almost eliminates the severity. And so they made the conclusion that the vaccines are safe. They do what they say on the tin. And that's why it has been licensed. So we know we've got a significant disease. We know we've got an effective vaccine but we've still got some concerns because we've heard all sorts of stories about the vaccine. So I thought I'll address some of them. So one of the things that has come up is that the vaccine causes irreversible, it doesn't change. You get the vaccine, you'll never recover. The trials specifically asked for side effects. So when you go for the vaccine, what happened? You are encouraged to report how you feel at the injection site, how you feel in your body. And then they monitor this over a long period. So the fact that they finished the trial and licensed it does not mean it will stop, okay? And the as part of what is always done for vaccines and has always been done for every vaccine, they compare it to what other vaccines do and say, weighing this against the harm of the disease we are trying to prevent, is it a problem? So when I had the injection, I had pain at the site. I felt a bit feverish the following day, okay? I took paracetamol, I went to work. Compared to the potential of serious infection and being hospitalized, is it a problem? That's what they are looking for. So it doesn't cause irreversible side effects. A major concern was that um, the vaccine was made too quickly to be safe. And um, it was approved too quickly. So there are two aspects to that. Why has it been possible to do the vaccine so quickly? Remember I told you that when you are making vaccines, I use the analogy of you've got a red Mercedes Benz and you've just taken the machine out, the engine out, and you've got the body. But the body of the Mercedes Benz that you want the body to re um, recognize, it's got so many intricate parts. When this was happened, there's now technology. They can map it out. And if you've been in the UK, we've been talking a lot about the Human Genome Project and how they've mapped out what um, the genetic code of human beings are and things like that. It's a relatively new technology. And for a while now, they've been looking to use that technology for drugs, for cancer drugs, 
for for various drugs for the Ebola vaccine that um, was implemented. I think it was 2019, two three years ago. So work, a lot of work has been going on. And then when we had this pandemic, the Chinese people who first had the experience with the vaccine released the genetic code of the vaccine and said, look, we've done a bit of work on it. This is it. So scientists, don't waste your time finding out what aspect of the bends is red or what aspect of the body is this or what aspect of the body is that. We've done it all for you. We've mapped it all out there. So go to work with it. And the other thing that happened with this effort was that everybody knew that hand face space is just buying us time. That is not what is going to make a difference with this pandemic, with controlling it. And I'll give you an example. In the Spanish flu, the 19, the, the pandemic 100 years ago that everybody has been referring to, by the time people came in contact with it, we didn't have vaccines for flu then. And then they developed a vaccine, what, 20, 30 years down the line. In the three years, it killed 50 million people. So we knew that, look, this is a respiratory virus. Everybody has to breathe. We need to find a vaccine. Technology is developed. They pumped money into it. Every country in the US, even Trump pumped, they called it what? Operation Warp Speed. They all pumped money into it. So because of the money that was there and it encouraged people, scientists who would normally be, I want to do it all by myself, were collaborating. So they've been able to do a lot of research and a lot of the work. I did it this way, and this is the impact that I got. So they've all brought it together. So that was one reason why it was um, quick to development. The other reason why they've been able to do it quickly is we're in the midst of a pandemic. So think about it. When they were doing the Ebola um, vaccine, they didn't have an Ebola mm. pandemic. You need to get infections mm. so that we can work out, is it by chance that you've recovered? Is it by chance that you're not in hospital? We've got lots of infections. So when they went out, mm. they were able to get loads of people to be able to tell these people are not in hospital, but these people are. Ah, the difference is those who are not in hospital have had the vaccine. So they were able to run the trial quickly and we call it time to event, okay? And then normally the regulatory bodies will wait. You finish your trial and then you bring it to them. And then they look at it objectively. As this was going on, as the trials was going on, remember people are dying. There is a need to develop the vaccine quickly. So the regulatory body said, as you are doing the trials, give us the data. And they worked alongside them. Night and day, people worked. And so by the time they were able to get it, a lot of red tape had been cut. And it's so much that it wasn't that they cut corners because remember that the government would be responsible for giving it to you. So they didn't cut corners, but they've cut a lot of red tape. Okay. And I can give you um, a, an example from my everyday job, my, my, my business, you know, my business as usual, my day job. So we approve drugs, we do drugs, and so it takes us 18 months to do approvals. With COVID, we've had to work. We worked over Christmas. I was logging off on the 24th when they called and said, we are getting a readout on one of our drugs and everybody is gone and they've said that we should pass it on to you. I worked over Christmas. So we cut it down. By the time the readout of the trials came, I can't remember which drug, 
it's, it's now a licensed drug. We had a policy ready so that people could get access to it. Now, somebody would say that you normally do it in 18 months, so you cut corners. No, we didn't cut corners. We cut red tape, okay? So that's why it's been so quickly done. Black people are being used as experiments. We've so far given over, I think it's now 10 million doses in the UK. We've given 100 million doses across the world. Every country, so far 65 countries have started vaccinating. Israel, God's chosen people, they lead the immunization rates. They've immunized almost 30% of their population. So it isn't just black people who are being given the vaccine. The whole world is in a race to vaccinate their people. Black, blacks have been prioritized, but have not been called. So in the UK, and this is specifically for the UK, we'll talk about Ghana in the next slide. In the UK, prioritization was done because we wanted to reduce the risk of death. So they've prioritized people into nine groups. And these are the nine groups. We've started with residents and care homes because a lot of them died. And then the older people down to those, the rest of the adult population who are um, more than 50, and then by the autumn, those who are less than 50. We have worked out that the majority of the at-risk Black population would be covered because of they've got underlying health conditions or because of their age. And then you are to wait and be called. You can't go in and say, I'm a diabetic, I'm a hypertensive, so I want to be vaccinated. It's being done in groups. And when it's your turn, the GP would call you. Healthcare workers and social care workers have been giving, um, the, you know, have been prioritized because there have to be people to look after the sick whilst and those in care homes and do the social care work whilst the rest of the population is catching up. Uh, Bill Gates created the virus in the tracker. And I, this time I remembered to bring it. Every major um, country has the flu pandemic as on their risk register. It's been the number one risk of every country. Chris Whitty has been talking about a flu pandemic for a long time. There, if you Google him, in addition to seeing things about him dancing, you know, you would see um, talks that he's giving on YouTube. And it's really interesting to listen to. He's been talking about have us been due a flu pandemic for a long time now. The UK, this is the report, they ran a flu pandemic simulation in 2019, okay? People expect it. So it's not surprising that Bill Gates, who has together with several philanthropists, have been working with developing countries to ensure that if you know their health systems are working, it's not surprising that they will talk about it. Um, a special vaccine for Blacks, Africans, and Caribbean countries has been made. So I thought I'd give you um, some information on what has happened. And this has quite a bit of detail. Don't worry about it. But we've got a global vaccine program. That's the Gavi, okay? Um, as I said, Bill Gates and a lot of philanthropists, you would have heard they said they want to give 99% of their money away before they die. So they've al always had this arrangement where they pay for, they work together and pay for vaccines for low and um, middle income countries. It's been the case for a long time. They've 
always provided safe vaccination. Gavi has provided the same vaccines that are available in the UK and the developed countries through what we call the Gavi arrangement. For coronavirus, they've come together to do what they um, to form what they've called a COVAX collaboration. And again, it's the same thing. And the whole idea is to make sure that low and middle income countries, the developing countries, are not left behind in the vaccination program. So you would see that they've made an announcement recently, um, end of January, and they've secured some doses, nowhere near enough. They've made an, uh, come to an agreement with the Serum Institute of India, where the AstraZeneca vaccine vaccine is being pro produced. So they are doing some different um, companies are doing it. India, they've been able to secure 100 million doses. It's not a different vaccine. It's the same vaccine, but they're being made in um, different countries. So you would recognize that um, for those in the UK, recently, I think last week, there was a bit of a vaccine spat. Vaccines, um, uh, some of the AstraZeneca vaccine is being made in Belgium. The fact that it's a UK vaccine doesn't mean it is all made in the UK. They make them in different countries, okay? So so this um, COVAX arrangement have, has enabled African and low, low and middle income countries to secure vaccines. Um, when was it? Over the weekend, the Taliban in Afghanistan actually announced that they've been promised $112 million to secure vaccines. And I thought I'd show you this graph too. So what has happened with vaccine production is the dark bit is the vaccines that the developed countries have bought. And you would have seen, if you listen to the news yesterday and possibly on the internet, that a lot of people are saying, all these vaccines that you've bought, you're not going to be able to use all of them. So for example, WHO is saying that the UK, when you've finished vaccinating those with underlying conditions, pass on your excess vaccine. We do, the developing and low income countries don't want to wait till June when there's a bit left, a bit left. And you can see those that is, um, the bit that is left gets bigger as you go on. We don't want to wait till then because the second wave has hit us. So give us some of what you are getting from now because we know that it's people with underlying conditions, it's people who are old, so that we can also start with them. So this is being made available to people in developing countries. And when I spoke to the people in Ghana, for example, they explained that, yes, they are expecting, I think it's, um, the, the current arrangement is, it's a quarter of, so the calculation is that a quarter of your population will be in the high risk groups. So the current agreement with COVAX through the WHO, what WHO has negotiated is that those as part of the COVAX collaboration will get at least 20, enough to vaccinate at least 25% um, of their population in the immediate future. So that is going to happen. The low and middle income countries are also going to get the vaccine. We will be forced to carry vaccine passports. This hasn't been announced as far as I'm concerned by any country. But what I wanted to also point out is that we are used to carrying something that says we've had vaccinations. When you travel to Ghana, when you travel across West Africa, you need evidence that you've had the yellow fever vaccination. When people are going to the Hajj, when, you know, we're used to taking vaccines and giving evidence that we've had that vaccine. So asking people to carry vaccine passports, even though it hasn't happened, it's not anything that, you know, should be a problem. You, nobody is forced to accept the yellow fever vaccination. But if you travel to a country and they require it and you don't have your yellow fever card, you will be kept at the airport and they will give it to you. Otherwise, don't come. And we accept that, okay? Vaccines are unsafe and that's why there were no pregnant women in the trials. 
that's false. So pregnant women are never included in initial trials. This is new. We're doing it. We don't know whether it would pass into the placenta to the baby. So it is something that happens with all drugs. We never test vaccines. We never test drugs in pregnant women. However, once it has been published, and I think they've reported a certain percentage of the women who were young have gotten pregnant post-vaccination. And so it hasn't impacted their fertility. It hasn't impacted those who are having babies. And um, I think recently, the Society of Obstetrics and Gynecology in the US have actually published on their website encouraging pregnant women to get the vaccine because the, the risk of getting the disease and the risk of that, the perceived risk from the, vi um, the vaccine is very low. So they feel you're at a bigger risk if you get COVID whilst you're pregnant. So you're better off taking the vaccine. So that's, that's not um, true. You can get COVID even after you've been vaccinated. And that is true. Why? Because it takes up to two weeks for your body to really be able to remember the virus and fight against it when you come in contact with it. Whilst you were being vaccinated, when you went for the vaccine, you could have been COVID positive. OK, you, you could have already had the infection. Remember our pyramid and not known that you have the infection. You could also get the infection when you've had the vaccine because you've gone out, you feel, hey, I've had the vaccine, but you can still get it. OK, and then it's also important to note that no vaccine is 100 percent effective. Now, it, it, it doesn't happen. And so we still continue to take precautions, okay? Because the other thing we've also got to realize is that the vaccine doesn't stop you coming in contact with the infection. So you might still be able to pass it on. It just stops you from getting severe disease because your body remembers it's seen it and it fights it. So it's not able to take hold of your body. So in summary, there's a safe vaccine that can help my immune system get ready for the real virus without me having to get the virus. We know that the vaccines are safe and they reduce my risk of disease. And we know that most of the information, most of the myths that we've discussed are not really true in terms of the vaccine. So when you are making your decision, that is what you are thinking about. Severe risk of infection, okay? Risk of a serious consequence. There's a vaccine that is safe, that is effective. Yes, I'll get pain at the injection site. I'll feel chills that, you know, I may feel tired, but at the end of the day, it prevents me. I will come in contact with the virus because it's around, okay? Um, and so it helps my body fight it. We've looked at a lot of the, information, the concerns that have been circulating. And we've realized that actually they are not facts. And so you make that choice. Um, choose wisely when, it, when you are called because the, the virus, it has severe, serious implications for black people. The vaccine is safe and effective. And all of us in the UK, in Africa, in the Caribbean, in America, everywhere, we will eventually get access to the vaccine and we will have to make a choice. Choose wisely. And just to finish, don't forget that despite the vaccine, we shouldn't forget hands, wash your hands, stop touching your face because it's a respiratory virus. You don't want to take it to your face and give people space. 
because it's passed by respiratory droplets. So you don't want to come in contact with it. Thank you. Thanks so much Doc, for this excellent uh, explanation on the virus. Thank you so much. We are deeply uh, uh, informed again tonight. And Sam, if anyone has questions, I would like you to uh, lead us in that section. Okay, oh, don't you have, don't people send questions in earlier. Yes, um, this, to before yes, you sorry, I'll pull them up. Yes. Okay, so the first question was, is sickle cell and sickle cell trait an underlying health issue or is it considered one? Okay. Yes, sickle cell disease is considered an underlying condition. And the reason sickle cell disease is considered an underlying condition is if you, you think of the name, it's sickle. Your blood um, cells are already sickle shaped, okay, when they lack oxygen. This is a respiratory virus. It's going to block the lungs. What happens is when it goes into the body, it's tells the body to make a lot like it. So it makes a lot like it in the cell and then it breaks the cell down. Now the cell has fluids and things like that. And that's why you get um, fluids in your nose. Um, you've got a cold, you know, you're congested, okay? And then the lungs. So that means that it decreases the amount of oxygen that is going to be able to go into your lungs and as you breathe in and out. So that causes a problem, especially for people who have sickle cell disease. And that's why we encouraged people who have sickle cell disease to also shield, because if you get, when they get pneumonia, they go into a painful crisis, don't they? So we encouraged them that they should shield. That's why it is considered an underlying condition. Sickle cell trait does not have that. So sickle cell, you are SS or you are SC. Sickle cell trait means you only have part of it. You are AS. So to all intents and purposes, you work, you, you, your body, your, the cells in your body work like any other person. So sickle cell trait is generally, I would say generally not a problem, but sickle cell disease is. With the MMR vaccine, it took years to discover it caused autism in children. You said that they've done trials and the, and the side effects is known. If there is a log on the internet, and they are currently logging cases, does it mean there are still side effects that could be potentially found? So the MMR vaccine does not cause autism. This was something that came up in the 1990s when a doctor called Wakefield was paid by a legal firm and a pharmaceutical, um, and they published some data that said that he's been struck off, okay? And we have since had a problem with people accepting the MMR vaccine. I have seen people die. When you live in this country, you don't see people with measles. When you live in developing countries and you see a child with measles, you will never forget it. I have had three children. My oldest daughter was in Ghana. I paid for the MMR vaccine because in Ghana, we only gave measles and mumps and then rubella. And when I was taking her to the US for, I was going to the US for a course, I needed to give the MMR. I had to go and pay hard cash to get it. We get it here for free. It doesn't cause autism. All three of my children have been vaccinated. And I would encourage, we've had several outbreaks of measles. I, I, I just want to talk to this. We have several outbreaks of measles in the United Kingdom whilst we are having the COVID pandemic. 
it is a problem, this MMR thing. Please, for those who have young children, please take the MMR vaccine. It does not cause autism. And then the question, there was another question about um, side effects and monitoring. We've always monitored vaccines. Um, the studies have shown that um, the side effects of vaccines are picked up in the first two months. And so we know in the first two months that this is going to happen or not. So we know that. But because vaccines, because you are giving something to someone who is not sick and you are saying that I want to prime you so that you don't get unwell, it's a long-standing thing that you want to know the very rare side effects. So this happens once in 10 million times. You want to know about it so that you determine. Remember, it's always a risk benefit. When you are going in for surgery, they tell you that one in 10,000 times, you are, you've got fibroids and you're going for a myomectomy or a hysterectomy. And they say one in 10,000 times that we cut into the uterus or something, you know, something goes wrong. We want you to know the risk, but it doesn't mean that it is going to happen. We want to know even for the very small risk, but we are that confident about it. Think about the billions of lives that vaccines have saved. And we've been able to do that because we monitor these side effects so that later on, we can tell that this might be a problem a very unlikely problem, but we will want you to know. But the fact that we monitor side effects for vaccines or any other drug doesn't mean we are not confident about it. We are generally very confident about these things before we put it out. Remember everybody, every doctor takes a vow and we basically say first do no harm. So you want to know no matter how small the risk is. And that's why we continue these phase four trials. So it's not something new for COVID. It's something that's done all the time. It is a fact that the number of vaccines around the world now. So what it's basically saying is that the vaccines, there aren't enough vaccines. Is it possible that the vaccines could be mixed? So can you go for AstraZeneca today and then when you go for your second dose, they'll give you the Moderna vaccine? It's unlikely is what I'll say. We generally do not encourage that. So it's very unlikely that would happen. And the subtext to that question has also been, can I choose what vaccine I get? And I think I was explaining it to someone that when we go to the shop, we get paracetamol. I'm going to buy some para. Hundreds of companies make paracetamol, but all, it's generic. So all we know is we've got paracetamol. When we've gone for our flu vaccine, we know we've gone for flu vaccine. We don't go and ask for the flu vaccine that Pfizer made, that um, AstraZeneca made. We, we've gone for our flu vaccine. And that's it. I think we know about the different vaccines because this is a new thing, but they are brand names. When you go, whatever is available, you will be giving, it will be giving to you. If someone took a flu jab before receiving the COVID vaccine, can there be an interaction between the two drugs? I, I think that it says that the two injections. So what happens is we normally say that if you've had the flu jab, wait for two weeks before you come for the COVID vaccine. There are myths that there is one vaccine that has been manufactured specifically for Africa. Is there any truth to that? No. And I actually looked up the countries where the trials have happened. There have been 43 different countries that they did the vaccine trials in. In Africa, Egypt, Morocco, and South Africa. 
are currently taking part in vaccine trials. And with a different hat on, I, I work with the National Institute of Health Research to do trials. We Blacks are very suspicious of trials. And I, will take, I want to take this opportunity to encourage all of us that it's only by trials that we can tell does this work or doesn't it work? Is there something peculiar about the black person, about the makeup of the black person? So I would like us to um, participate in some of these trials. It is important we participate in trials, but back to the question, has a specific vaccine been made for Africa no, as I explained to you, we already get vaccines in Africa and in the Caribbean from Gavi. They've always given us the same vaccines that are made in these factories that make it for the Europeans and the Americans. COVAX is the same thing. They are going to make available the same vaccines. And think about it, the pharmaceutical companies are making these vaccines. They are selling them. They are, it's a technology. So they are not going to make a specific vaccine. A different company is not going to come up and just make a specific vaccine and um, you know, get the EMA or the um, medicines and health regulations authority in the UK to license it. So that's unlikely to happen. Even though it may come from India or somewhere, as we've seen in the last week with what happened in Ireland, it's the same vaccine manufactured in different places in the world. What is the level of protection between the first and second shot of the COVID-19 vaccine? As we are all aware, the government has decided to extend the period between the first and second shot of the vaccine. So in the trials, the vaccine was given at an interval of 21 days. And as we all know, mm -hmm. in the UK, that has been extended, okay? What is the level of coverage? It is believed that it is about at least 50%. So I'm not holding brief for the government. That is policy. We can't change it. We've just got to accept it. And the reasoning is that we've got a vaccine that provides 90%, is 90% effective. The flu vaccine that we take, it's about 40, 45%. When we were going into trials, we were happy with 50%. So the rationale is that it's better to give, let's say 100 people 50% than to give 50 people 100%. And as you've seen on the debates in the news and on the internet, we don't have enough. Already WHO is saying that the UK, when you immunize your old people and those with underlying conditions, give, give the rest to us. We also want to go and immunize people. If both your father and mother were alive, would you want one to have 90% and the other to have zero? Or would you prefer them to each have 50%? And that's the rationale behind it. Do we have evidence that is going to happen it's very tentative, but it's plausible. And there are challenges to that, which the government is mindful of. And I know that they are looking to publish information regarding that in the next few weeks. How often should we be vaccinated against COVID, against COVID-19? Would it be annually just like the flu jab? We don't know but it's likely. And why am I saying it's likely? So in the last week, a study has been published where they looked at those who had the infection and yeah. they monitoring their antibodies. And they've realized that the antibodies come down and you would have heard that about a few people have had the infection twice. So we know that the natural immunity 
wanes and decreases after some time. So you can get it again. We don't know how long, it's currently being monitored, but we don't know how long the, your body will remember the antibodies will last for the, um, the COVID vaccine. So we are anticipating, I mean, it, it would be natural. It, it, it's, you know, like the flu vaccine, we go for it every year. It's very possible. It's plausible scientifically, but at the moment we don't know for sure. Um, the period, the period for which the two vaccines were produced still pro um, raises some concerns. I'm concerned one of the long-term side effects could be infertility, which might come to light later on. What advice would you give to young people like me, bearing in mind we are yet to have children? I would say go for the vaccine. So we had this question at the first session that we had, and we've looked it, I've looked it up. People are getting pregnant who have had the vaccine. The vaccine has been tested in the lab where they found it didn't have any impact on the fertility of um, mice. And that's where we always start trials. So they check, they reproduce a lot quickly. So we check, did it have an impact there? No, it didn't before we brought it into real life. Now in real life, people who have had the vaccine, remember there've been a hundred million doses giving out since um, December, okay? Between December and now, a hundred million people have had it. And before then, people in the trials, over 40,000 in the Pfizer, over 30, almost 40, another additional 40, uh, 38,000 in the Moderna and another 40,000 in the AstraZeneca trials have had it and they are pregnant. People are not infertile. It hasn't had, people have reported that it may affect, um, um, it, it may cause erectile dysfunctions. This isn't something that has noted. They are all speculations. And I want to make a specific plea to the young people when it comes to you when you have the opportunity please take it you may think you are not at risk of severe disease but you could get it and you could pass it on to someone and we don't know remember the pyramid of disease again we don't know who will be the odd person who will break through and get severe disease we are at the moment setting up long COVID clinics for people who've had severe disease and are living the consequences of it. It is potentially very serious. Take it for yourself. Take it for your loved ones. It is quite important that you do because we all have to be immunized. The population, you need about 80% of people to be immunized for the virus to stop circulating. So if our young people are saying that, they, you know, because they are young and they, they are not diabetics or hypertensive, they won't be affected, that will be problematic. Please, young people, accept the vaccine when it's given to you. I was talking to my son and he said that um, the youth will not be impressed by what you say. You need to be an influencer, a, a social media influencer. So I don't know what I need to do to become a social media influencer, but for those of you who are young and are social media influencers, Please go out there and tell your friends it is important that when they get the opportunity, they take the vaccine. Protect yourself, protect your loved ones from getting this na nasty virus. That was the last question. I don't know if there are any more in the chat. Okay, so if you, if you want to ask any question, you can... Just put your hand up, or oh, yeah, then I can give you the platform. So you can indicate the the hand symbol, and then I can call you because I can't see other cameras. So.
I can't see any hand up now. Any question? Wow. Okay. Interesting. Pastor, there's no hand up. Okay. okay. Once again, thanks so much, Doc, for this elaborate presentation. Uh, well structured. Uh, we can all see the hard work that has gone into the preparation and the professionalism uh, of this piece. Um, we are all aware of this new variant and how devastating it has become. January has been, uh, I think there's a, there was a question at the bottom. Okay. Uh, January has been one of the most difficult um, uh, months for all of us, as we've seen so many loved ones passing with COVID-19. Uh, I've had two of my close family members passing with this uh, virus. And um, as we bring this presentation to a close, I want you to uh, prayerfully make the right choice and understand that you do not take the vaccine for yourself only, but also for your family and for all those who are dependent on you. Thank you, God bless you, Pastor, and goodbye to Pastor, every one of you. Pastor, Thank you again, Doc. Yes. Pastor, there was a, I don't yes. know, but yes. there was one question on the chat. That you raised. Oh, was there a hand? Yeah, there was a, somebody put a question yes. in, the, in the chat, so I don't know if you want me to read it. Yeah, I'm happy to take it. Yes, I can't read. see it. Okay, so it says, okay, that, that um, let me see. So it says that, is it a coincidence that Bill Gates sold his shares before COVID? Um, and then this raises eyebrows to support all the conspiracy term, and it makes one thing twice. You know what? They interviewed Bill Gates recently, and um, I'm not, sh I, I can't remember what it was on. He was absolutely gobsmacked at the vitriol and the, the hateful things that people have said. So think about it. You have dedicated your life to help people. And People are saying all sorts of stories. Look, a lot of my mates were educated. A lot of the people manning the pandemic in Ghana were educated on Gates scholarships. So, the, you know, I, I, I think it's, it's very unfair, okay? I have been a beneficiary because I got the Gavi vaccines in Ghana. We have all of us here we've taken Bill Gates vaccines before. If he was going to do something, you know, like I said the last time, it's probably easier to do something to the black community based on what we eat. We have such unhealthy dietary habits and they will put it in Coke, not in vaccines to help us. So that's, that's you know, my tongue in cheek way of responding to that. But he may have sold his shares. Um, last week, was it Friday? There's been a scandal on the internet about some um, armchair investors who decided to give people a thrashing. As for selling shares, it sold every day. I don't know that he sold his shares. I, I don't know about that. But I do know that he has dedicated his life and has said, I am giving 90 nine percent of my money away before I die okay and he has chosen to use that to help the people so look at it in that context and I will address this other issue after the session the last time there was an, a question raised somebody sent me a question about Barack Obama saying that Blacks should not um, take the vaccine um, and he will not be taking it. I don't know how many of you have seen that um, clip or whatever. Barack Obama has done a clip with Bill Clinton and um, what's the other one, talking about why it is important 
for the black community, the black population, for the whole world to get it. And he is impatiently waiting his turn to get the vaccine. So you see, for some of these things, please check it. Um, you know, and let's be sensitive about what, what we say. Pastor Kingsley said he's lost two family people. Today, a very close friend and her dad have died in Ghana. I came this close to canceling this yeah. station and I was telling my classmates, yeah. I will do it in honor of her. We all went to school together. I've played with her. Her mother taught me to bake bread. Today, they've died in Ghana. So this vaccine thing, you know, this coronavirus, it's serious. I spoke to Na on the 4th of January. Today she's dead. It's very serious. It's very serious. And don't take some of these, um, you know, don't, I've said this several times and I'll repeat it again because somebody else may be watching. Please don't pass on those WhatsApp clips. Whatever is true, Whatever is excellent, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about those things. When these clips are saying all sorts of things, is it positive? How, how are you helping the people who are watching it? If you don't know, ask. This is what I got from it. Is it true? Ask. Please, don't pass on the clips. Very true. Very true. As, as, um... I think <laughs> I think this is coming from um, one of the network passes. It says one of the okay network passes. Um, it says he's asking for a, a man called him for prayer. Apparently, he has done this uh, juju thing where anything metal or steel that touches him breaks. He says if anything touches his body, it breaks. His GP is aware. He's asking if. <laughs> Um, he's asking if the vaccine could be taken in any any other way rather than injection in, rather than injection because he is scared. So um, I would say he should pray and he should go. Look, I'm a doctor. I have a needle needle phobia. When I went for the injection, I was scared. I. If you ask the people in my house, everybody knows I'm scared of injections. But I was like, COVID versus injection, God help me. And he helped me. I sat there and they gave it to me. This one, he should pray. I don't think, honestly, some of these things, it's psychological. It might be that he tenses his muscle whenever a needle comes near him or something like that. I can't explain it scientifically. But what I would say is that he shouldn't do things out of fear. We, we should practice, I have said this before, let's practicalize the Bible that we read, okay? We, we don't make decisions out of fear. We make decisions, we've been giving a spirit that enables us, we have a sound mind. And let's, let's have that. So I would say he should prayerfully consider it. Call someone, call, um, you know, some of your pastors, call your friends, pray with them calm down nothing is going to happen to you go with that frame of mind and he will be okay he shouldn't just trot out no weapon fashion against us shall prosper when he's reading the bible he should go out and operationalize that mm -hmm. thank you thank you yeah, any other right. questions yeah No, I can't see any hand up. So. Okay. Pastor, I think that, that is it. Yeah. Yes. Thank you again, Doc. I'm sure yeah. this is the final. Uh, uh, thank you. And um, for, for today, but we can't say thank you enough. And to all our listeners and those who will be listening at the end, I, I just want to read um, a passage of scripture for you where the Apostle Paul wrote to 
um, the Philippines and said that finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. And the things we've had tonight are not only true and pure and honest and just and, 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 and pure and lovely, um, but also the, true, the real facts and things that will help us live our lives to the maximum here on this earth. The COVID-19 is real. It is not an illusion. It is not a, a fragment of someone's imagination. People are dying. And God works through doctors. Just as the uh, man of God, Luke, was a doctor. So I pray that you all go make the right decisions and save yourself, save your family, and also keep our NHS safe. God bless you, and thank you so much. Goodbye to every one of you. Goodbye. See you all again, See and thank you. Bye-bye.